Hello. Today, very easy. You probably already know how to compute the circumference, <laughs> pardon me, circumference of a circle, assuming that you know our circumference. Is, I think you probably already know is just the distance all the way around the circle. For instance, well, there's no for instance about it. It's the distance all the way around the circle. Hardly any easier way to say it. How do you compute that, given R? Well, you do it this way. You take R and you multiply by 2 pi. That's all there is to it. Some of the formulas, for instance, for a perimeter for a polygon, it's real easy. You just add up all the sides. With this one, well, it's not so obvious, is it? I mean, you could add up all the little arc lengths. And in fact, what we end up doing is, to prove this, in other words, or to show that it's true, you would have to inscribe a polygon and make the sides smaller and smaller and smaller until there were an infinite number of sides. So to derive this, you'd have to know some calculus and understand limits, and then you'd have to know that n times the sine of, let's see here, I think it's 180 over n. Well, that's usually written, well, heck, didn't give myself enough room. To show the truth of this circumference formula, you'd have to understand this expression, which is that n times the sine of 180 over n. Well, as n goes to infinity, what happens? The bigger the n gets, the smaller this part gets. For instance, suppose n was 20 million. Well, 180 over 20 million is pretty close to zero, isn't it? And the sine of zero is zero. So this part is approaching zero. On the other hand, the n here is going to infinity. And what happens is they offset so as to end up with a limiting ratio of pi. But that's pretty confusing, and frankly this is all part of calculus. If you plan to go on to study calculus, you will at some point prove this formula. But right now, trying to explain limits and why in the world infinity times zero would turn out to be pi, well, there's just no way to explain that with what we know about this course, because zero times anything is zero. But limits well, that's quite a bit different. We're not saying that n times the sine of 180 over n equals pi. We're saying that as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this whole expression gets closer and closer to pi. Well, that's your 30-second calculus course. Don't worry about it. All you need to know is 2 pi r, and I'm just telling you this so you know why other times we prove things, including involving areas and perimeters. Here we have a circumference. I hand you the formula, and I don't even tell you why. Well. In a calculus class, I'll tell you why, but in this one, we'll just make life easy and say, this is the formula. Everyone knows this is the formula. On the standardized state exam, they're not going to ask you to figure this out or to explain this or to prove the formula for the circumference or area of a circle. But if you're extremely curious, you can go on and look this stuff up, and this is what you'll find. And if you're confused, maybe you've got someone around who knows a little calculus who can explain it to you. So, now that you know how to get the circumference, which you probably already knew, we're going to figure out how to get the length of some section of that circumference. And a section of a circumference, as we know, is called an arc. The measure of the arc, the measure of AB, is the same as the measure of the interior angle. Remember, we had a theorem out here. It's not the same as the inscribed angle. If we drew lines from the circumference out here, 2A and 2B, that would be an inscribed angle, and it would be half of the central angle. We only need to talk about the central angle right now. It gives us the measure of the arc, but that's really the same as telling us what piece of the circle this is, or how big a piece, I should say. 
it's 360 degrees all the way around and we're using up alpha of those degrees so if we want to know how far it is from here to here suppose we just went like this what fraction of 360 is alpha that would tell us for instance if alpha was 10 then it's 1 36th uh, all the way around in other words we take this and we multiply it by our circumference C and that will give us the length of AB which we can just write like that in other words you can drop the measure when you're talking about the length but what is C? Uh -huh. Well, that's 2 pi r, right? So, given r and the central angle, or conversely the measure of this arc, in degrees, we can always find the length. All we need is the angle and this. And of course, when we substitute 2 pi r in there for C, we get alpha times alpha over 360 times this stuff. So you might sometimes see this written as alpha over 180 times pi r. That means they just canceled out the 2 and the 360 and performed a little arithmetic, got rid of the 2 and changed this to 180. You might see it written that way as well. But all this is saying is what fraction of the full 360 degrees is this? The length of this thing will be exactly the same fraction of the entire circumference as this is a fraction of the 360 degrees all the way around any circle. The R here is very important. Different radii for the same angle are going to have different arc lengths. And it's kind of easy to see. I mean, for instance, I have an angle here. And suppose the circle of this size intercepted this angle. Well, here's the arc, but then there's a, a bigger circle down here with a whole different radius. Let's pretend this is the center of our circle and these are all different radii. Well, I think you can see pretty easily that the distance between these two rays forming the angle gets bigger and bigger as we get farther out. That's an important property of angles or deviations from a particular line. The farther out you get, the more you've deviated. For instance, suppose this were totally out of scale and this was like one degree. And suppose you were, uh, say, firing a rifle. If you were one degree off, well, out here you might be off like half an inch. Out here you could be off a whole foot. The farther out you go, the farther off you're going to be for any given angle. Suppose you were surveying for a railroad and you're coming in from one side with your railroad tracks. <laughs> These are crooked railroad tracks. Riding those would probably make you seasick. And then you're coming in from another side over here. Well, if you're off, your measurements are off, and you run a hundred miles with that tiny half a degree error, your railroad tracks won't match up. A tiny error of maybe one degree or less, maybe a tenth of a degree, a hundred miles away, way off here to the right off the page, you'll end up way over here. And the track you're trying to meet up with is here. You could be a quarter mile, half a mile off. That's a huge and expensive mistake. That's, you'd have to cover a whole lot of ground to make that up and relay track. It would be awful. And that's what's going on here. The smaller the circle is, here's a small circle with the same center. Well, I think you can see this arc is not the
the same. The length of this arc is not the same as the length of this arc. The measures for each arc are the same. Here's our central angle. The measure of this arc is alpha. The measure of this arc is alpha. But when you go farther out, the radius gets bigger. The distance from the two endpoints gets larger, and the arc, which subtends that. We could actually draw a straight line from here to here, which we know now is called a chord. Well, the larger the chord that subtends the arc, the larger the arc. I think we already proved that in a uh, previous sections. But it's very intuitively obvious that smaller r means a smaller arc length for the same angle. Well, this looks familiar. A student, well, I doubt that it was a student, says that two arcs from different circles have the same arc length if their central angles have the same measure. Well, I think we just showed, just a minute ago, that there's a lot more to it than the angle. A radius makes a huge difference. The farther out you go, the larger the radius, then the larger will be the arc that subtends that angle. We have two different circles. We may have the same central angle here, alpha. Two different arcs. A1, B1, and A2, B2, circle 1 and circle 2. Well, I think you can pretty easily see that every term here is exactly the same except for R. Here we have R1, here we have R2. So, whether these arcs are equal or not depends on R1 and R2. If we have the same radius, meaning we have either the same circle or a congruent circle, then, sure, the same central angle will imply the same arc length. But if we don't happen to have R1 equals R2, then these two definitely aren't equal. But I still don't think that's something a student would say. That sounds like something Crazy Ed down at the Tool and Feed store would say. There's one that we shouldn't have trouble with. What they want you to do is find the perimeter of the shaded area, not the rectangle. But this is a... Uh, I don't know what this is. It doesn't remind me of anything in particular. It might look like something to you. They want the... which is... they know what the perimeter would be this line, or side, and this side and then the length of this curve here and this curve. Luckily, these curves were... I didn't specifically say, but we're going to pretend that these came from a circle. So this would be the diameter of that circle. And remember 2 pi r, I don't know if I mentioned it, is the same as pi d, right? 2R is D, the diameter. If you've already got the diameter, you can use pi D if you want to. And what do we have here? This side plus this side will be 2 times 13. And what about these? Well, it looks to me like these are identical, are they? If they aren't, they should have given us a dimension over here. We're going to have to assume that this is also 13. That's what I did here. And that the diameter for this is also 6. Well, what is the circumference here? It's 1 half of the whole thing, which would be pi times 6. That's this arc length. It's just a half arc. Well, plus this. So if I multiply that by 2, I should get the whole thing.
Well, if we just perform the arithmetic here, we'll write this out, 2 times 13, that's that net, 2 times this, the length of this arc, which would, is a semicircle. Let's see, we cancel and we get pi times 6, so we get 26 plus 6 pi. And that's kind of a clumsy looking number, so if you get your calculator, you can rewrite it this way, 44.8. 3.14, if you don't happen to have a pi button on your calculator, you can use 3.14, pretty much always works. Actually, pi, as I'm sure you know, goes out forever, it never stops. But we have to stop at some point, and 3.14 works most of the time. Sometimes if you end up with a number just in terms of pi, like if the 26 wasn't there, and the answer was 6 pi. You'd probably get by with just leaving it as 6 pi. But as I say, this looks kind of clumsy. So go ahead and grab your calculator. You can use the pi button on your calculator or 3.14. Now this one's really pretty easy. And they say describe. Well, gee whiz, it seems to me it's quicker and easier to just use the formulas for these things to show and even prove the effect of doubling the radius or doubling the measure. And in this case, a proof or demonstration I think is quicker and easier than any kind of verbal description you might come up with. For instance, what is EF? With radius r, it's x degrees over 360 times 2 pi r. All right. Now, suppose we double the radius. So if I call this one r1, now our next circle, let's say r2 equals 2 times r1. Suppose we actually just write it out. So we've got one circle with double the radius of another one. Well, our first circle is x naught over, pardon me, x degrees over 360 times 2 pi r1. That's our radius of circle 1. Suppose now we want to double it so r2 is 2 times r1. What's the arc length of E2, F2? Again, x degrees over 360 times 2 pi r2. But r2 is just double r1, so we just write it out. Substitute 2r1 for r2 here. Pull the 2 out, put it in front. Well, if we block this off, x degrees over 360 times 2 pi r1. Well, that was just the arc length we got over here for E1, F1 on circle 1. So, what happens when you double the radius of the circle? You double the arc length. That's kind of easy, isn't it? It's just if you triple the radius. Whatever you do, when you substitute it in here, you can just use your commutative rule, meaning that you can multiply in any order, pull it out in front here, block this off, like that. Well, that's the arc length on the first circle before you expanded the radius. So, whatever you multiply the radius by, you will do the same thing to the arc length. which means, keep in mind, that all circles are similar. If they have exactly the same radius, they're congruent. Otherwise, they're similar. So when I write this, I'm really saying that R2 over R1 equals 2. So this is can be considered a scale factor. So it shouldn't be a big surprise, since the circumference is to a circle what a perimeter is to a polygon. They're analogous. It's just all the way around the circle. It kind of makes sense that the, the distance all the way around 
would change exactly the same way the scale factor does, which is exactly the same way the perimeter does. Now, suppose we double the measure of EF. Well, now we're not really talking about similar circles anymore. However, we can do exactly the same thing, and it's going to work out exactly the same way. It's hardly even worth writing down. Suppose I have that the first angle, it's that one, and that equals, well, let's do it the other way, x2. It's 2 times x1. Our second central angle is double the first one. Well, then all I have to do is substitute. If this were x1, then I would write 2 times x1 here. And heck, now I've already got the 2 out in front. I don't have to rearrange anything to end up with this and exactly the same thing. And it might occur to you that as you're doubling things in formulas, when the variables you're doubling enter into it once linearly, then you're going to double everything. It kind of makes sense in this situation, right? You double this, then R2 is 2 times R1. If you doubled this one, X2 would be 2 times X1, and you'd end up with the same thing. So if you really wanted a verbal description, the description would be you double the uh, arc length. <laughs> when you double the radius, you double the arc length. Double the measure, you double the arc length. But I, I don't see any reason not to just write it out and show for sure that you're definitely right. And when you say that you've doubled the arc length, you can definitely back that up very easily with the formula. Now here, we just need our formulas for arc length, and I think we have to pay attention. I think they're trying to mess us up here. We've got uh, WY is a diameter there, both diameters. Okay. And the diameter is 6. So we can immediately write, if we need it, which we may not, R equals 3. Okay. They also tell us that XY equals 140 and they want the length of YZ. Well, this is YZ here, but they gave us the measure of this. Our formula for arc length tells us we have to know this angle here. This is the central angle. That way we know the measure of this arc. The measure of this arc doesn't quite get us there, does it? Well, it might. Let's see what happens here. These two lines cross, so we have two vertical pairs of angles, meaning this angle is congruent to this one, and this angle is congruent to this one. And this one has a measure of 140. Well, that means this one has a measure of 140. It's 360 all the way around, and we've used up 280 of those on these two arcs. What's left over, we can divide by 2, and that'll have to be this angle, on it? And I think that turns out to be 80 degrees left over, which means this must be 40 degrees, if I haven't made any mistakes yet. And don't bet the farm on that. So the length of YZ, now that we know the central angle, should be 40 over 360. And I think that's 1 over 9 times 2 pi 3. Hmm, well, got some cancellation here. We get 2 thirds pi. And what we have over here, oh, here we go, very first one, 2 thirds pi. 
all you had to do was to, to get this one right it was pay attention it would be easy to assume that they're giving you the measure of the same mark that they're asking you to find the length of of which they're asking you to find the length but that would lead to an error they gave you this measure and they're asking you for the length of this arc that's why we just had to do a little an extra step in here our first step was to use this information to get this angle and then everything else was real easy now here's a kind of a cool problem at least uh, this guy thought it was uh oh <laughs> I'm gonna take a shot at it and say maybe it's Eratosthenes but if you really want to know if I were you I'd look it up don't take my word for it Eratosthenes is about as my best guess but my best guess when it comes to Greek isn't all that good. He wanted to figure out the circumference of the Earth, making some assumptions that actually we can make those assumptions today to solve certain uh, geometry problems. Because the Sun is so far away that the angle from one spot to another made by the Sun's rays is going to be so slight by one spot, I mean one spot on the Earth, because the uh, the distances presented to the Sun by the Earth are so tiny compared to the distance from the Sun. Any actual angles are really close to zero. Well, what he did was. He measured the angle of the sun's rays with a stick at one point on the surface, but it was the same time of day both times. And then he went to another point where the sun shone directly into the well, which for his purposes meant that a radius from the center of the earth to that well if continued on would continue right along with the ray of sunlight in other words this is all one ray the sunlight here and then the radius leading down to the center of the earth you might be scratching your head right now saying but wait a minute I was told that not that long ago people thought the earth was flat and they didn't sail west to the new world because they thought they'd fall off the planet well, things like that are a result of something that you don't get told a lot. Knowledge did not grow linearly. Things that Egyptians knew in 3000 BC, maybe 4000 BC, were forgotten after the fall of the Roman Empire. That's called the Dark Ages. Yeah, some people now don't like Dark Ages and call it the Middle Ages, but I still like Dark Ages because it's extremely descriptive of what really happened. And what really happened is tons and tons of things that people knew got lost. Up to the fall of the Roman Empire, I don't think anybody believed the Earth was flat, and if it sailed far enough, you'd fall off of it. Nobody believed that. that was, the Egyptians knew the Earth was round. They figured it out using... Well, experiments similar to what uh, Aristosthenes did, a little bit different, but it was easy for them to uh, demonstrate that the Earth had to be round. So if, you're, if you've heard somewhere that, well, not that long ago people thought the world was flat, well, that's true. Not that long ago people were extraordinarily dim-witted or ignorant, because after the fall of the Roman Empire all the information just disappeared. So there were people in the 12th century who, with respect to knowledge, had a tiny fraction of the information that people 3,000 years before had. If you ever watch those post-apocalyptic movies, that's what the Dark Ages were like. So it's not ridiculous for a Greek 
2,000 years ago to know that the Earth was round, even though a farmer in Europe in the 12th century might not have known that. It's weird, but that's the truth. Well, now that we've cleared up that misunderstanding, what about the mathematics of the situation? Well, if we consider this to be a transversal, and assume that the rays of sunlight are parallel to each other, that means this line here, L2, is parallel to L1. So we've got two parallel lines cut by a transversal. That means angle 1 and angle 2 are alternate interior angles. And we know from a long time ago well, not by Greek standards, but let's just say a few months ago. These angles are congruent, so we can write that this angle here is also 7.2 degrees. Well, let's take a look at our formula. Remember, it's 2 pi r. Times the angle over 360. And that will give us, well, let's see here, let's call this A and B. That's the, well, that's not much of a B, G was, there we go. This is B, this is A. Well, he estimated 575 miles since when you measure distance on Earth, you are not measuring the distance, the straight cord here connecting the two points. You're automatically computing the distance or the length of this arc because the surface of the Earth is not really flat. The Earth isn't a polygon, it's a sphere. In two dimensions, it's a circle. So we set this equal to 575. That's the arc length from here to here. We know the angle, that's 7.2. So all we have to do is solve for r. When we've got r, we use 2 pi r to get the circumference. Of course, if we do what I just said, we wouldn't be using our head, would we? Yeah, we could solve for r and then use it to find the circumference, but we have the circumference right here, don't we? Maybe what we should do is just solve for 2 pi r. It's kind of weird, you don't usually solve for a group, but maybe it'll look better if I rewrite 2 pi r as c. Well, then we got 360. Multiply by 1 over 360 on each side and get that 575 times 360 over, and this angle turned out to be 7.2, right? That should give us the answer that Eratosthenes arrived at. Well, he got 28,750. I think it's closer to 25 or 26. We can measure it a little more accurately these days, for one thing. His measurement of the distance from here to here would have been just hopefully a good estimate, but not super precise. Same thing with the angle measure here. There's always some error involved when you're reading an instrument. We don't know how accurate the 7.2 is. But still, considering what he had to work with, which was fairly primitive tools, pretty much nothing but his own brain, and that was enough to come up with an excellent estimate for the circumference of the Earth. And of course if he wanted to, he could have estimated the radius of the Earth, simply by dividing through by a 2 pi, getting r. And that gives you a diameter of about 9,000 miles, and I think the real diameter is closer to 8,000.
And like I said, that's with primitive instruments and not knowing as much about the science of measurement as we do. That's pretty good. Well, this one's very easy, but it leads into a second one that we're going to do. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, we have radius r. So what's the arc length of this? Well, it's a semicircle, so that's 180 degrees. 180 over 360 is one half. So you can just stick that in right off the bat, because we know that's our fraction. And the whole thing is 2 pi r. Okay, but we've got four of those, don't we? Well, once we cancel our twos, we're going to get 4 pi r. Very simple. So let's write the answer down here, so I've got some room to put in the second problem. Okay, so we've got this one here. Now they ask us, suppose we just keep dividing this up into congruent segments. We've listed R again as, well, for this one, for AB, here's R now. So, in other words, this is the R up here. Well, this was the radius for this circle. It's become the diameter for this circle, hasn't it? So, the arc length for one of these is going to be pi times r, which is now the diameter. Don't forget that. <laughs> it's going to be confusing because we're so used to seeing 2 pi r. Remember, this r is from up here. So it's just pi r. And of course, it's one half of that because it's a semicircle. The problem is we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of these. So we're going to have to multiply that by 8. Hmm, looks like 4 pi r. But remember, that's the original r, not this one. This one is actually r over 2. And what about this? And let's go ahead and use the legitimate r for this one, which is r over 4, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. This is this r is broken up into four little r's, I guess you could say. <laughs> Remember, this is the r from this one up here. So, it's r over four. This circumference of this circle would be two pi r over four, but this is only half of that, so we have to multiply that by one half. And we've got 16 of these now, right? So all those tiny little arc lengths have to be multiplied by 16. And what's all this going to work out to? Well, 4 times 2 is 8. Down here at the denominator, we've got a 16 up here. And this is, so this becomes 2. We cross these two out, and what do we end up with? 4 pi r. So, that's the interesting result, I thought. Because when you line up four semicircles along this line here, this way, and then fill it in with eight smaller ones, or 16 even smaller ones, the total surface, or, you know, you'd say that the uh, length of the surface never changes. It's still 4 pi r even though we've got 16 tiny circles here and four big ones here. And frankly, I don't see anything that would lead you to decide right off the bat, just from glancing at this, that adding up all the lengths of these little ones would be exactly the same as adding up all these lengths. But it turns out to be true. Every one of them.
of these is 4 pi r. Just keep in mind that r is the original radius. Well, that's about it.